Last time on the Salty Siren. Now, let's get into the meat and potatoes and talk about the movie U571 and how it holds up to the realities of submarine warfare and just general history. The goal of the crew is to pose as German soldiers, board the U-571, and steal the Enigma coding machine. So to sum up the movie, um, it's it's pretty decent. It's good popcorn uh, material. Um, it's a very 90s movie. No, the U-571 is an actual uh, U-boat that was in World War II. Over the course of this sub's career, it had a total of nine successful patrols in the Arctic, the North Atlantic, and the Central Atlantic. The story of the U-571 isn't super interesting on a surface level. As you might have guessed, there are other events during the war that actually were inspirations for this movie. It is loosely based on several different events involving German subs during World War II, including the subs U-110, U-570, U-559, and U-505. This event involving U-110 is the most direct inspiration for the movie because this is where a Enigma machine is successfully stolen from the Germans for the first time. O'er the wild windy sea I can hear her calling to me So let's heave away Haul away and fill our eyes with the shore Calls to friends, ale and light And a tale to brighten the night So heave away, haul away And heed the siren song So When the movie U-571 came out, it was generally well-received by critics. Uh, I looked it up. I think it has like a 65% on on tomatoes. So, you know, pretty pretty good. Um, I had fond enough memories of it to, you know, write this episode. Um, And other people I've talked to and who've mentioned it have fond memories of it as well. It was nominated for two Oscars at the 73rd Academy Awards for Best Sound and Best Editing. (laughs) Just a shitload of explosion. (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly what I thought of when I read that. Just uh, fucking deafen the, you know, audience. Um, and to be fair, the the rest of the movie does sound pretty good. The creaking sounds from the sub and, like, the scraping of, you know, torpedoes out of their tubes and along the subs. Um, I think it is deserving. It did win. It did win the best sound editing award. Yeah, well, I mean, there you go. Which, by the way, that is like a guaranteed way to send shivers down my spine. Is that like metal 
it's such a specific noise, but like metal creaking under the immense pressure of water. <laughs> like something about that. Ooh, it just the heebie jeebies. Yeah, that that is anxiety in a can. Pretty much. I mean, in submarines literally in a can. <laughs> yeah. The, as you might have guessed, the film received a lot of backlash from history buffs, um, survivors of the real events, and even figures of the British government. Really? Uh, were they portrayed as, like, cowards or something in it? We'll, we'll get into it. Um... Let me look up something really quick. Yeah. I will say, being on the actual U-505, I, I, I'm sure it was like this for basically any submarine back in the day, and probably still is, but holy shit, it looked so miserable. <laughs> there were only enough cots for like a third of the crew. And so you just did that shit called hot bunking. Right. Where you would just go and wake up the the dude in your bed, get into bed, sleep, and then the third guy would come and wake you up. And then the first guy would wake up the third guy when it was like it just constant rotating and no showers. Or, like, any sort of way to bathe yourself. And so, it was literally, like, just... Like, working man stench. And, like, <laughs> every single, like... Sort of, like, high contact disease known to man was just like ricocheting between the crew because <laughs> you're just like literally on top of each other like all of the time and if you were like in any of the compartments near the engines it was like regularly over a hundred degrees fahrenheit like oh yeah being on an old sub i mean I can't imagine being on a modern sub is that great either, but being on an old sub was just straight up canned misery. Yeah. Or it, miser misery concentrate. Yeah. I mean, like, modern subs are still a bit rough. I, I dated a girl a, a long time ago, and her dad had served on a, a submarine in, like, the 90s and was basically completely deaf from it because he'd worked in, like, the engine rooms. And so yeah. even the more modern ones, I think, are pretty pretty miserable machines. But back to the movie. Jonathan Mostow, the director of U571, is basically retelling the story of the capture of the Enigma, sh Enigma machine by British forces from U-110. Except that the British destroyer Bulldog is now a obsolete U.S. S-class submarine filled with American sailors disguised as a German resupply sub. Mm -hmm. So just taking the British out of it all together. Pretty much. Um, according to the U.S. Naval Institute, uh, the Britons, you know, did not take this well. Um, survivors of the engagement were pretty angry with Mostow for taking such liberties with you know, all of these events. And, you know, for U-1110, in, which is an event that King George VI described as 
the single most important action in the war. And, you know, that's definitely up for debate, but definitely, you know, a, a big deal. Yeah, I, it's certainly up there at the very least. Um, Lieutenant Command David Baum, who himself carried the Enigma out of U-1110, was uh, understandably outraged by the American usurpation of this historic British feat. Yeah. So, I mean, the Americans did some stuff with code breaking, but like a lot of it came from that initial capture and like Bletchley Park. Yeah. So, I was kind of surprised. The director, Mostow, and the other filmmakers actually handled this pretty well. Um, to appease Baum, the filmmakers promised Baum full credits at the end of the movie. Baum was pleased with uh, their response, saying that the filmmakers were, quote, very sorry they had upset the British and are trying to put it right, end quote. Um, Universal Pictures actually flew Baum to Malta, Italy, where they were filming it, where he got to meet the cast and learn about, you know, the process and what they were doing. Um, his perspective, uh, Baum's perspective on the movie changes after that. And he said, quote, he absolutely loved it. And pointed out that, quote, they spent $75 million making this film so there's got to be american action to get their money back end quote yeah i mean i i understand why they did it because you know it's hollywood and so you're gonna want to make it like the americans are like the main guys but right I don't know. Yeah, and I, I don't think it would have made that big of a difference if they just had British people, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll have let, let me let me continue on. We'll have more opportunities to discuss this. Yeah. Um So, Baum was assuaged, but then a member of parliament uh, Paul Truswell wrote to Universal in 1999 saying that the historical transformation was, quote, a source of great concern, uh, end quote, to his constituents whose contributions had paid for one of the ships that had forced the U-1110 to the surface. So, you know, these people had a stake in preserving the history of this event, which was being rewritten as, you know, American Rudy Tooty subs and shooty. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mastow explained that he had no intention, quote, of stealing credit from the courageous men who captured the Enigma machine. Instead, he clarifies, quote, our film is a fictional account of World War II American submarine sailors, end quote. He said the inspiration for the story he had written came from two sources, Operation Drumbeat, Hitler's devastating U-boat attacks on shipping along the east coast of the United States in 1942 and the U.S. Navy's capture of U-505 in 1944. Hmm. There's more from Mostow. Uh, 
Mako Masta recognized that he had, quote, a moral responsibility not to rewrite history. I believe that I am fulfilling that obligation. It is my sincere hope that U571 will focus public attention on aspects of the Battle of the Atlantic that would otherwise risk slipping into the footnotes of history. I hope that young people particularly will see this fictional movie and be motivated to study about the real life heroes who fought to preserve world freedom end quote yeah I, I mean I can see it yeah I, I, well, so, I mean that movie is what caused us to research this topic <laughs> so he's right yeah. there yeah it, it inspired us two nerds to you know figure out what actually happened um and now all of you and now all of you uh the u.s naval institute uh doesn't really side with mostow in this case and explains that for a lot of people they you know see a war movie and they don't really have the motivation or you know they don't care to separate fact from reality and the movie just becomes fact to them i mean yeah that that is true to a degree because i do think like history is a pretty niche interest to have so yeah. yeah Either you're an actual history buff or you're a gym teacher who teaches history and, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I, I don't know what it is recently, but I've been seeing more and more memes that are just, like, ragging on gym teachers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you ever wondered, you know... I don't know how far back this goes, but for at least for the Zoomers, if you've ever wondered why your your history teacher was also your football coach, um, it is history is one of the easiest tracks for someone who just wants to coach, you know, high school blank sport, basically. Yeah. Not that there's anything wrong with that, and I'm, you know, I'm glad people are learning history. But if you were wondering, that's that's a likely reason why. Mm-hmm. I was I was lucky to have a lot of really great history teachers growing up, and I mean, my dad was a big history buff as well. Well, still is. So I was pushed in that direction from an early age. But yeah, yeah, I I feel sorry for a lot of people who are just like, I don't know, history class is like super boring. I'm like, a shout out to Mr. Brits, my eighth grade history teacher, who was pretty sweet. Yeah, well, I'm I'm very glad. Yeah, he brought in. Uh, he was like a big into like civil war history it was kind of what we covered around like eighth grade ish Mm -hmm. but he brought in like uniforms of like confederate and uh you know union soldiers and like hard tack and bugles and like all that (laughs) shit so that's fun yep i have also held hard tack that was made during the civil war (laughs) <laughs> how how hard was it on a scale of like one to rock oh you you could have built a house with the shit like it was <laughs> <laughs> it was really really hard which i'm sure you know over a hundred years didn't help at any but <laughs> but but the fact that it survived a hundred years yeah i mean hey like no real mold or anything like that on it so i was i was impressed if anything There are 
some more technical historical ac- inaccuracies in the movie, which are, you know, make the film more exciting, but are pretty silly when we look into them. So in the movie... They use a an obsolete S class US sub, uh, which they resupply, or sorry, which they modify to look like a German U boat, which will pose as the resupply sub. This is despite the fact that the four obsolete submarines based on the East Coast in World War II only served as training craft and the two combat ready s-class boats in the pacific not the atlantic were lost early in the war Mm. yeah so it wasn't even possible that you know i guess if a s-class sub had been on the east coast at this time i guess they could have possibly modified it to look like a u-boat a german u-boat but um that was not the case there is some accuracy uh as to what life was like on the sub thanks to the work of Captain Hans Joachim Krug, a former U-boat commander who served as one of the German consultants to the director Mostow, and from two members of the technical staff who, like Krug, worked in the production of Das Boot. Oh, yeah. Yeah which I have never seen, but uh, for you listeners, um, Das Boot is another old submarine movie from West Germany, and it is you know, widely considered to be one of the classic uh, war movies. Um, so, and I can attest to like the operation of the sub in the movie and you know what they're actually doing seems pretty you know pretty accurate um i think they captured what it was like pretty well um but in other aspects krug wasn't too impressed with mostow he quote found that jonathan mostow showed very little interest in these matters and historical correctness, end quote. Yeah, (laughs) I got that vibe. Yeah. And as a result, Krug said his suggestions for correcting errors in uniform uh, or other matters were generally not accepted. Um, In particular... Krug noted that the German destroyer, quote, looked the plump tugboat that it was. No mariner would mistake her for a sleek two-stack destroyer. At least a dummy could have been added for a second stack, end quote. Um, Again, Mostow ignored Krug's advice. Um, Yeah, if you look up the 
in the movie they you know encounter a destroyer and a german destroyer and they have to fight it um i haven't looked up what actual german destroyers look like but the ship that they use is basically a tugboat like yeah. a, a large a large tugboat it does not but, look the part no and they just slap some you know turrets on it and called it a day yeah man um in light of his experiences working on the production krug concluded that mastow's claim that submarines had always fascinated him quote sounds rather superficial to me irrespective of historical correctness not always relevant for a screenplay the plot is to me rather unrealistic end quote yeah because i mean if they like the controls are all in german and like no matter how well you know the american submarine that you've served on i'm sure the controls of a u-boat are vastly different <laughs> Yeah, and so I, that was the part that first stuck out to me when it's like, oh no, now we have to use this U boat to get home. It, I, it'd be like, how how the fuck would you? <laughs> like, yeah, how would you be able to just like, well, this uh, this lever that says like, Obersgruppen für Ballast, <laughs> like I know what that means that, <laughs> you know, just kind of goofy yeah and in, in the movie they, there is an a kind of an explanation for this um on their boarding party for you know taking control of u571 they have one guy who speaks german and <laughs> hans you know, deutsch person <laughs> yeah and you know, I, I, I've never served in World War II high command, but I might try a little harder to find a few more people that speak German, except for one person. Yeah. But, um, yeah, in the movie, when they board and they have to like get away in the German U-boat, like they're pulling the you know the guy speaks in german they're pulling him from all directions they're like what does this say what does this say and he's reading it to them um so there's at least that um yeah <laughs> some more like technical inaccuracies um when the actual german resupply sub appears in the movie it blows up the disguised american sub and this is it's a big pretty big reach because during this scene it is at nighttime it is also storming so when this resupply sub got there how how the fuck would it know which sub is which and you know much less which one to shoot yeah and i mean like i can kind of get it if it's like it hears the intercept signal or it hears the distress signal and it's like mm -hmm. all right i'm gonna go out there see what i can do and you get there and there's another sub there that didn't like respond on the same wavelength and you're like okay something's fucky and once you figure it out wouldn't you be like oh dang that's probably like you know i think they're compromised why wouldn't you just like sink both you know <laughs> like if you're just like oh dang they're like hooked up and clearly like the people from this sketchy submarine are like on board the other submarine to some degree like we can't risk them taking the enigma 
you know, torpedo him. Yeah. Anyway. I, I don't know. It when I having watched the movie and like thinking about the scene and how it was set up, it is pretty it's pretty dubious as to you know why they decided to sink the you know anyway it was it was to you know basically kick off the movie that that occurrence yeah a it happened because the plot needed it to yeah um more more about this scene in particular um when the american boarding party escapes using u571 the two subs uh engage in a underwater torpedo battle uh while underwater and yeah that's <laughs> that's not how that shit works yeah uh, submariners uh, will attest that it was virtually impossible to hit another submerged sub you know without a homing torpedo which were not invented yet Mm -hmm. well because also weren't they designed to effectively like float at a certain depth so you'd kind of launch it and it would just like go at that depth oh uh, i don't know um that makes a lot of sense yeah because it was like uh what the hell was it like uh, effectively they were supposed to like reach a certain depth once they were launched so that they were sufficiently below the water line that they would cause a rupture in vital parts but not so low that they would go under a ship right and so there i remember reading at some point that there were like different torpedoes depending on like what type of ship you thought you were engaging that like if you were fighting something that would have a relatively shallow profile under the water like a destroyer you had to count like use different torpedoes or maybe tune the torpedoes to like float at a sort of higher or like less underwater (laughs) sort of depth so that they'd actually hit the ship instead of going under it yeah yeah, there there is no circumstance where this German sub would have a torpedo that would you know shoot basically straight ahead, and also just no circumstance where they could actually hit the other sub. Yeah, because like you also just can't fucking see. Like, the only thing you have is sonar, which just gives you, what, like, a a vague picture of what the ocean floor is around you? Yeah, a vague idea of what is around you. Um, yeah, so there's, there's that one. Uh, and then at one point in the movie, a German single-engined a land-based fighter plane shows up um, basically out of nowhere in the middle of the Atlantic and starts shooting at the U-571. And I'm pretty sure it's a Messerschmitt uh, BF-109. And Isn't that a German plane? Yeah. yeah oh. it's a- so, so how the fuck did it know that they were not a, a friendly sub. Oh, I I think the. You know, I think. Well, I don't know how the original resupply sub figured it out, but the resupply sub like radioed, you know, German command and said, "Hey, there's a commandeered, you know, uh, sub." Okay. Gotcha. But there is. 
really no feasible way or reason for how a BF-109 could make it out to the middle of the Atlantic on its own. Yeah. I mean, the Germans didn't really have aircraft carriers, so... No. They had plans for one, and it was dumb as hell, but... They they wanted to make like a uh, what the hell was it like a a battle carrier, so they they had made a carrier with like heavier armor and like more gun ports and it's like the whole goal of a carrier is that it just never gets touched. <laughs> yeah, they're trying to do both things at the same time, and it probably would have been stupid as hell. Well, it's just like, you know, your plane takes off and, like, while it's still fucking taxiing, it's getting shot at by anti-aircraft guns. Like, yeah. it just doesn't make sense. You know, so there's that. Um, <laughs> the U.S. Naval Institute article that I was reading uh, puts it very well when they talk about the, quote, longest and loudest loudest depth charging scene in cinematic history <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah they're right on top of the parliament member writing a letter to universal you know saying sugma um uh tony blair himself a former prime minister of britain uh called the movie quote an affront <laughs> on british sailors yeah that were killed yeah that that sounds like a a blair thing to say yeah um but yeah that's uh that's the story of this movie and how pretty much completely made up it is yep oh man thank god for hollywood how else (laughs) would we have so many historical inaccuracies floating around yeah um i i more side with and i think i'm pretty much always gonna side with the angle of historical accuracy because um you read about the real stories and you're like yeah that could be a really cool interesting movie um and then they make movies like this and they said no it's 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 not interesting enough yeah i don't know it's I guess they want it to be, like, exceptional in some way, and they're like, that just sounds like a standard war story, and it's like, literally, U-505, the dude got the Medal of Honor. Like, yeah, you know, uh, actual U-571, like, just, I don't, which, granted, there's kind of the the problems that come with, like, trying to portray any part of world war ii from the german side but uh there's just like so many different stories they could have picked and run with that would have been a good movie in and of themselves but they feel the need to like amp it up and yeah that's just oh yeah and (laughs) what you said reminded me um made a lot of Germans kind of angry too because um, at one point in the movie it portrays uh, the Germans like they have some prisoners or something and or oh yeah in the in the beginning they sink a you know a vessel and there's a little 
uh, life raft and there's some survivors and at first they're like they're like yeah yeah come come to the boat well you know you're prisoners of war um and then they basically just gun them down yeah um so there's there's shit like that where they make the germans seem like bigger monsters than you know they they portray them doing things they didn't do just to make them seem more evil yeah no and it's it's tough because i i actually took a for for those of you unaware i have my minor in german through college and uh, while i was in college i took this class called deutsch exploitation which <laughs> is effectively like German exploitation films and that sort of thing. And something that we covered pretty heavily in it was like the the sort of like the myth of the clean Wehrmacht that like there's there's been this thing forever that was like oh yeah the SS they were like Nazis but the Wehrmacht was like the regular army that was just regular dudes who were just fighting for their country and it's like I, I mean yeah but like a whole shitload of them were nazis too and so it just it becomes really difficult to portray the german side of world war ii without making them comically evil because yeah. if if you go for like yeah they were just soldiers doing their job then people are like but a whole shitload of them were monsters and that's correct but also if you portray them as like mustache twirling like i'm going to gun down civilians <laughs> it's like then yeah that happened and like they did that but i don't know like Pretty much every nation in World War II did, like, really horrible things, and that yeah. sort of stuff happened all the time. And so it's just... Ugh, it's it's tough. There's basically no way to portray Germans in World War II without it being controversial to a degree. So, yeah. Yeah. It's it's tough. Damned if you do, damned if you don't. Yeah, I will say shouts to um, Jojo Rabbit, which I personally think is a a really good portrayal of uh, Germans in Germany during World War Two. Yeah. Um, and you know, also just like one of my favorite movies of all time. But yeah, no, Jojo Rabbit's fantastic. And it, it also shows just, like, how big of an impact the Nazi party had on, like, just, like, kids, dude. Like, you know, that it was literally, like, ship your kids off to fucking indoctrination camp. And, yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, the, and, and it was it was played up, but you know for it is a comedy so it was played up but it was basically summer camp for these kids yeah summer camp that revolved a lot around like military actions yeah so i don't know i i don't know it's it's just tough it's tough to it's a tough period to portray in general in in film yeah but there's also so many aspects of it that have just you know get get warped over time and all of that sort of stuff so it's it's frustrating when you have movies that also contribute to that and are like yeah we're gonna further muddy the waters by making this really unrealistic uh you know sub movie or what have you yeah um i wanted to give a shout out to the 
Naval History and Heritage Command, um, as well as the uh, U.S. Uh, Naval Institute, both great sources for today's topic. Um, the um, Naval History and Heritage Command uh, is this organization that traces its lineage back to 1794 when the Navy Department Library was established under the Naval Bureau, which was a part of the War Department in Philadelphia. Um, so pretty old. Um, they have a few museums and locations around the country. Um, they're headquartered uh, on the historic Washington Navy Yard in DC. Um, and they maintain the Navy's mm -hmm. oldest commissioned warship, the USS Constitution in Boston, Massachusetts. Oh, hey, there you go. Yeah. So I'd say they're they're a credible source if there ever was one. But uh yeah, that's all I got. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking us through the <laughs> lack of realism <laughs> in this movie. <laughs> Yeah. I'd say watch it if you want to watch it. Um it's as long as you know it's not historically accurate, I'm I'm fine with that. Um I will say it is a decent like like I said before, it's it's like Die Hard but on a submarine. So it's a decently entertaining movie. Yeah. Well, with that, I, I suppose we can move into our uh, what's been happening in our lives section and kind of start closing things out. Alrighty. Uh, I have bought a house. I don't know how much I talked about it last time. I don't remember, but I think you were um, talking about it may be happening sometime soon. But Okay. Well, I bought a house. Uh, it's a very nice house. I've been to it. Yeah, it's uh, in an older neighborhood of St. Louis. It's over 100 years old. Uh, I love it a lot. Um, the, it being an old house, um, there is never not something to do, uh, you know, fixing slash renovation wise. Um, but yeah. Um, and now it's time for David to tell you about War Thunder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So... I've, I had a friend of mine get me into War Thunder, and so I've been playing that some. It's, it's fun. It's a bunch of different vehicles, all that sort of stuff. It is unrealistic, or it's realistic but not at the same time, <laughs> because it's kind of like, oh, cool, like... I punched through the armor of this tank in this spot, so that means I killed these two members of the crew, and now the tank reloads slower, and, like, you know, all that stuff. But at the same time, the uh, there's a reason the memes surrounding the game are, like, Stalinium <laughs> and Bias Incarnate. It's, it's made by a Russian developer, and so just about anything Russian in the game is, like, way better than it ever was in real life. But it's still a good amount of fun. It's free. I've been enjoying it. Uh, other than that, pretty much just been, been vibing, hanging out, 
and uh yeah that's that's about it from me yeah i i I did watch a video kind of recently um I, i'm glad that war thunder at least makes the actual vehicles you know barring the you know i don't know much about it but maybe barring the russian tanks um the planes and vehicles are actually pretty accurate um the prototype flying wing german jet is a playable um vehicle in the game but yeah. you know surprise surprise it's a piece of shit <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, the one of those things that like German scientists straight up lied about to get a job with the U.S. was that fighter plane that he was yeah. like, yeah, we had a working prototype. It was also super hard to detect by radar because we covered it in a special paint and the U.S. basically like made it and like covered it in said paint and was just like yeah that did that didn't do jack shit <laughs> <It's>, yeah <laughs> it just which also like the only prototypes they had were like made entirely of wood and just had like straight up fucking wood screws in them and stuff like that and it's like yeah that's not that's not great at like hiding from radar but yeah you do you which also the the U.S. already had working flying wing projects like in like 1941, so nah. yeah, because a lot of people will point to that like German flying wing and be like that was the inspiration for the B two bomber, and it's like mm, no, was it? No, it <laughs> no, it wasn't. <laughs> Like the the fucking the company that made the U.S.'s flying wing projects just happens to be the same company that also made the B two. Like I think they probably used their own designs. But anyway, I digress. All right, we ready to end it? I think so. Well, thank you so much. For stopping in to the Salty Siren once again. We apologize again for the delay. Life happens. Um, it does indeed. Uh, we hope to get on more of a regular schedule for your sake and for our sake because we really enjoy doing this. So um i would like to thank joe koziak for mixing and mastering the intro and outro and i'd like to thank colin drown at colin underscore drawn on instagram for our lovely art yes thank you both we had a blast i hope you did too and we'll see you next time. Adios. Oh, Johnny, Johnny, call and hear the ancient song of sailors long forgone and sailors still to be. A sweet and solemn tune spoke gently by the tide. O oh, Johnny, Johnny, fall, join the song.